Okay. Uh, welcome to Adulting on the Spectrum. I am Andrew Comro, an autistic certified financial planner. I co-run Adulting on the Spectrum with Eileen Lamb. Hey, Eileen. Hey, Andrew. Hey, everyone. I'm Eileen Lamb. I'm an autistic author and photographer. Anyway, in this podcast, we, we want to highlight real voices of autistic adults, not just inspirational stories, but people like us talking about their day-to-day life. Um, basically, we want to give a voice to a variety of autistic people. And our guest today has an inspirational story. Today, our guest is Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin became a prominent author and speaker on both autism and animal behavior. Today, she is a professor of animal sciences at Colorado State University. She also has a successful career consulting on both livestock handling equipment, design, and animal welfare. She has been featured on national and international TV, appeared in articles in Time Magazine, the New York Times, among others. HBO made an Emmy award-winning movie about her life, and she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. Hi, Dr. Grandin, and thank you so much for being with us uh, today. It is such an honor to have you. Great to be here. So we start all our episodes by asking our guests how they like to identify. And what I mean by that is that we would like to know your preferred pronouns, but also do you like um, person with autism, autistic person, on the spectrum? What are your preferences? Well, you can address me either as, you know, Dr. Grandin or Temple Grandin. And, uh, I, you know, I get asked all the time about whether it be person first or identity first. And, and I, I always have said all my life, you know, autistic, I'm an autistic person. Uh, and I know that some people on the spectrum prefer that. I'm, I'm fine with it either way. Yeah, that, that's how we feel. Um, there's been a, a lot of uh, discussion about what the right terminology is. And, you know, feel like this is a, a personal matter, and that's why we like to ask our guests if they have a preference. So when and how did you get diagnosed with autism? Uh, What do you think that process would be like if you were diagnosed today, for better and or for worse? Well, I was born in 1947, so doctors didn't really know much about autism. Fortunately, the first doctor I was taken to was Dr. Bronson Trubbers, a neurologist, Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, so they looked at things neurologically. They checked to make sure I was not deaf. That's something you always must do with little kids. And they checked to make sure I did not have epilepsy. I did not have either one of those things. And then she, the doctor referred my mother to a really good speech therapy school that two teachers taught out of their home. Uh, and there were these really good teachers that know how to work with kids. And they'd slow down when they talked to me. So I got very good early intervention by age two and a half. I did not speak until I was four. And since this was so early, as I'll be 74 in August, uh, they just, she labeled me as brain damaged. And the autism diagnosis came in later, but I had all of the standard symptoms. You know, there's a lot of services today that are um, not available. A child like me in my generation normally would have just been put in an institution, a little kid like me. And then the kids that had no speech delay, what they used to call Asperger's syndrome, those ended up getting jobs. I have grandfathers coming up to me all the time and they tell me uh, they found out they were autistic when the kids got diagnosed but they had paper routes and I mean, they're working in the computer field or as accountants or a lot of, you know, different, um, you know, different uh, good jobs. Um, so my early childhood went really well, went into a small school and my mother and the teachers worked together, small local school, that went really well. And mother always had a good sense of how to push me, always giving me choices, developing my interest in art. A normal big high school is a disaster, bullying, teasing, I got kicked out of ninth grade for chucking a, a book at a girl who bullied me and called me a retard. And I ended up going to a school for kids with problems. And they put me to work running a horse barn. And I learned how to work. And that was something that was really uh, good. I had nine stalls I had to clean every day. They horses in and out and feed them. I was basically responsible for the horse barn. And uh, it, studying didn't do much of that until my science teacher came on the scene. And, about the third year I was there. And he started giving me interesting projects and he used those projects to get me motivated to study. Now studying was a pathway to a goal of becoming a scientist. See, I think that's a really important thing. A student has to have a reason to want to study, but I had great mentors. I had my speech teacher, my mother, my third grade teacher was excellent. And then my science teacher. And then getting my business started, there was a a wonderful contractor. 
just starting a tiny business for steel and concrete work for the cattle industry in Arizona. And he was a former Marine Corps captain and he seeked me out, he'd seen my drawings. And he seeked me out, he was another important mentor and helped me get my business started. You've been in advocacy for, so for a very long time. Yes. And what are some of the ways autism advocacy has changed from your early days to today? Are you seeing much of a difference? Well, the biggest difference is you didn't have individuals on the spectrum doing advocacy in the early days, because when it all started, it was the first society was called the Society for um, Aut uh, the Autistic Children, because of those parents of autistic kids that got the society together. I'm old enough to remember that. So yeah, it's definitely changed. You know, in the last 20 years, you've got a lot of individuals on the spectrum of doing advocacy. You did not have that much when I started. And actually, I don't know if you've listened to our previous podcast episodes, but uh, Thomas McKean was one of our previous guests. Yeah, I know him. And, and it, it sounds like it was, you mentioned a couple others that were, have been, a, but back when you were doing it, it well, sounds Jim like when Sinclair he was. Sinclair would be another one. He's yeah. been around for a long time. And also, and I wrote about him in my autobiography, Thinking in Pictures. I did this back in the, in the mid 90s. And then my first book, Emergence, so I wrote autistic, and I used the term autistic there. Um, I, uh, that was in the mid eighties. I, uh, uh, you know, I've written about some of the, you know, sort of stuff about autistic sensory problems and things like this. There was very little information. Like my mother had no information. You know, she was really kind of just on her own, but fortunately we had this really good doctor in the very beginning when I was two and a half and a super good speech therapy teacher. Those were two very important people when I was, when I was two and a half years old. Yeah, I, I assume that back then, not a lot of kids were diagnosed with, with autism, when now we have the tools um, to diagnose early. And social media, I feel like, has been a, been a big help in helping parents um, recognize the early signs of autism. And there is so much more awareness. I don't know if you're aware of the neurodiversity movement. Yes, um, yes I definitely am aware of that. What, what do you think about it? Well, I agree with a lot of it. See, but one of the problems that you have with autism is you're going all the way from someone like me that when I was two and a half, I looked really severe. And then you have um, individuals with no speech delay where uh, they're just kind of geeky and nerdy. Here's one of them right here, Elon Musk. <laughs> These yellow post-it notes, they've been in there six years when I first bought this book. And I marked the pages while I was sure he was autistic. Now, <laughs> now he has, uh, came out on Saturday Night Live. So now I can say it. <laughs> so you're going from Elon Musk or Albert Einstein who didn't talk until age three to someone who can never learn to dress themselves and may have other very serious medical issues on top of everything. And that's labeled autism. And then you've got the nonverbal individual. And here's a book that's just recently come out by nonverbal person who types independently. And there's another book on Tito Makapata Hey, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move, who, who describes um, his experiences and, and he has difficulty controlling his movements. So you have this wide range that's all labeled the same thing. See, this is one of the problems with verbal thinking. They, they overgeneralize. Yeah, I, I'm with you here. Um, I think part of the issue that we see, because there's a lot of controversy on social media, is that it's become almost too broad. For instance, my son is, my oldest son is eight and he's nonverbal. And yeah, you know, he can communicate basic needs with AAC and app on his iPad, but just needs like he can't communicate his feelings or anything. And not everyone who is on the severe side of the spectrum can communicate. Um, and I love reading all those books from people on the, who are nonverbal, but not everyone who is nonverbal, you know, can like write a book well, or communicate. Those sorts. Yeah. The, you don't know. And in one of the books is Carly's voice. And I was reading through that. And the speech therapist almost took the typing, the typing function off of her device. Thank God, goodness that she did not take the typing function off. That's and she uh, learned to type you know, completely independently. And there's others that cannot do it. I saw an interesting program the other day and I'm a visual thinker. So this is how I remember the name of this communication program. It's Snap Core Plus. Well, the way I remember that is a mousetrap that snapped with an apple core tied in it plus. Because I don't remember names well unless I can put a picture with it. And it started out with uh, words to sort of get things done like more. Uh, then you could get into, you know, 
names of foods and things like this. Uh, then, of course, you have Pro Logo to go, and you've got proponents of both of those programs. One thing I liked about the SNAP Core Plus is that it was not very expensive. And this is another big problem I've run into with services. I've given talks down in low income areas. You've got three year olds that are not talking, they're waiting two years for a diagnosis, and the kid's just sitting zoned out on computers and TV. That's really bad. And they can't get services because the research is very clear. Okay, it was obvious to my mother by the time I was two and a half, something was really wrong, and I wasn't developing like a little girl next door. And I got into a very good early intervention, and that's super important. Yeah, it's not very accessible. I mean, my son uses Proloquo to go that you mentioned, but it's like $250 on the App Store, and then you still have to get the tablet, uh, the iPad, and you need help to... Well, that's the problem. Now, the SnapCore Plus is a $50 do you think it's just as good? Would you recommend I, that, it? I think people will argue about that. But well, people will argue about anything. Well, they'll right? argue, they'll if you argue say the sky is stuff, blue, we will it, have disagreements. But it's a whole, I, I kind of, you know, this one mom that was using it, she just loved it. And the price is a whole lot better. The other thing that you can use on a tablet is just text messaging. Put it in airplane mode so you can't send the text and just use the text messaging program. And that, the on, on getting tablets, um, I had a student that, um, you know, she didn't have a laptop. I said, you know what, you look around, I think you can adopt a laptop. And she looked around, she adopted a laptop, and it had a CD drive, an old-fashioned CD drive, CD drive, but she actually found that she liked. Uh, there's a lot more of this stuff around in, in the neighborhood than you might think, but we've got to get stuff that's affordable. With text messaging, I'm... Um, I think a phone is too small for most people to use. Now, one thing they did on this Snap for Go, which stops the person from doing too fast, is it you can put a little delay in it. So it might have a quarter second delay or half second delay, so they don't just go crazy all over the keyboard. And that might be helpful for some people and for others, others not. But the price was a whole lot better too. And it looked like all oh, this mom was raving. This is great information. I will definitely uh, share it with my followers and let them know because every time I share Proloquo to go, people are like, Ugh. I'm like, yeah, I know. Some insurances will cover it though with a letter yeah, from a speech right. therapist. So, but it's it's a process. So if we can get it cheaper and quicker. And that's the other better. thing is just plain old text message yeah. on a tablet. That's that's good. But yeah, you know, which is which is really accessible and and I. The thing that amazes me is just how many old electronics are just like around. All those tablets got to do is do the text messaging. Yeah, it's gone a long way, even from when I was a kid. Uh, so how can we best advocate for autistic people who can communicate to us how they feel? Well, autistic people, okay, let's, let's, let's break it down by some ages. Okay. Whether it's little kids or whether it's adults. Now, this show is supposed to be about adulting, but people have got to have a way of communicating. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk and throwing temper tantrums because I was so frustrated because I could not talk. Got to have a way to communicate. That is essential. And it can be something as simple as a picture board with some things they can point to, which you can make out of a piece of cardboard. I don't think, that, I don't think that's ideal, but it's, it's still something. You know, and some people like to do sign language. What for not to have a way to communicate. How about the kids who can't like point or who can't, you know, my son can do sign language because he doesn't have the fine motor skills they or any different skills. So how, how do we help those, you know, kids who are severely autistic but often have um, comorbid conditions um, that makes it hard to even communicate in all of these different well, thing that, ways? The Cheeto and, and also Noki the Japanese Boy, who now has a book, uh, but I never can remember this title. I like fall down five times, get up seven times. It's a sequel to the reason I jumped. And he's older. So I think it's a better book. He's older. And he explains things like not being able to control his movements. Cheeto describes things like sensory scrambling. I, these are problems that I don't have. I, but one thing that, that many people describe is the concentration required to screen out background noise. Uh, Cheeto has to really concentrate, write one sentence. And then he's got to flap and calm down and rest because they uh, really, really big effort. But I met Tito and there's no question that um, he's got a brain inside there. I showed him a picture of uh, 
of an astronaut riding a horse in the desert that I found in the library, because that's what I was visiting with him. I wanted something where his mother couldn't possibly be queuing it or something she'd know about. And I asked him, tell me about this picture. And he typed super fast and he was not touched in any way, Apollo 11 on a horse. There's no way that could have been queued. But the uh, little keyboard thing was on the desk that was not touched and Tito was not touched. And I, and I just pulled a magazine out of a stack of magazines and I found that picture and I wanted something where it wasn't something he would have seen before. Yeah. So we have we have a topic that I think you'd probably prefer to talk about more than autism, although we, we managed to kind of combine the two. Don't worry. Um, do you have any thoughts about diversity in agriculture? Uh, have you seen more diversity lately? Uh, yes. uh, black indigenous people of color, women, neurodivergent oh. individuals. What, what are your when thoughts on that? When I first started in ag, there were almost no women. And being a woman in the man's field of the cattle industry, that was really hard. And what I had to do is to make myself really good. And, and when people saw my drawings, you saw my drawings right here in my book, Thinking in Pictures, then I got respect. And then I also started writing for our state farm maps. And people very quickly learned that I could write really accurate summaries of maybe the Arizona cattle feeders meeting. And, and now there's lots of women in the industry, lots and lots of them. You know, that's been that way for the last 20 years. But when I started back in the early 70s, I, there were, I got kicked out of a feed yard or saw in the movie for, they put bull testicles on my vehicle. That actually happened. That is true. It wasn't easy being a woman in the man's industry in the early 70s, but I had to make myself really good at what I did. And where I had most of the trouble, it was not the owners of the feed yards. It was the foreman's. Almost all my trouble was with middle management. It wasn't the big bosses and it was not the owners. They actually were on the side. Middle management. And it was the cowboy foreman who put the bull testicles on the vehicle. Do you do you think it's better now? Or do you think it's still and, and how do you see the direction going? Well, it's a whole lot better now uh, compared to the 70s. There's no question about that. But there's still plenty of discrimination going on. Um, I've read some of the um, all these, these surveys they do with resumes and you send out resumes with a girl's name on it or maybe a black person's name on it. You see how many job offers they get? There's a whole bunch of these studies. The result is still hideous. Let's just look at the hard data. I've looked some of that stuff up. And uh, you know, that's just sending in the same exact resume. All you did is put a different name on it. And given that it's a lot harder to just walk in in person and show somebody your work as you did and you know apply somewhere, right? Should Oh, I'm a big believer in the back door to jobs. Yeah. Half of all good jobs are backdoor. And I always had my portfolio with me because you never know where you can show up your portfolio. And I've told a lot of people to make a portfolio of their work. Now, the kind of stuff I did, I had portfolios of articles I've written. I had portfolios of my projects. So I could have photographs of projects. I could have drawings. And when I showed off my drawings, people were impressed. That, so you, um, and and, and you, they look at the drawings and they kind of go, oh, you may be weird, but you drew that. <laughs> That's where I started to get respect. I learned how to sell the work by showing off the portfolio. And I've suggested to other people to do this. You could do the same thing with computer programming. You know, and, and presentation matters. It needs to be presented really right. And you don't need to send a gigantic hundreds of pages of stuff. You basically want a 30 second lab. That's the way I sold Cardio. I designed the front end of every Cardio beef plant in North America. And I sent a portfolio to the head of Cargo. This was back in the late 80s. It had a big fold out drawing. It had two plastic pages full of pictures. It had a professional brochure that I had made, a cover letter, and two trade magazine articles. That's all that was in it. It sold them. And I just sent it in the mail, cold. I didn't know how to call the guy. I didn't know his phone number, but I had the address. And now it's almost even easier to send an email with the information, or you can send the physical mail, or it might be easier to find a phone number to just be able to Well, it's to easier to people. find a phone number, but the problem now with the strange attachments, nobody wants to open strange attachments. So I'd recommend um, calling it, and it might even be a place for the old fashioned mail. And, but the mistake I see is, and I see a lot, I made this mistake of being too much stuff, they don't, don't send them a book full of junk. It was one of my best drawings, a couple of pages of my best pictures. 
and then and then since I was doing ranch feedlot and meatpacking plant equipment, if I'm going to sell the meatpacking plant, I send my meatpacking plant pictures, not my ranch pictures. And I learned. And I also learned this is back in the days of papers. I let my portfolio get shabby. That was not. That was a mistake. Presentation matters. We we know you have a huge love of for animals. What is your protest? contribution to the field of animal science? Well, I have things from an engineering standpoint. Um, you know, my, my proudest achievement is to be the center track restrainer system, conveyor restrainer system for cattle. Every big plant's got one for bathing. But the thing that probably made the biggest difference in welfare was a very simple scoring system I developed for evaluating slaughterhouses, where you're looking at the outcome, things like electric produce, animals falling down, cattle fell around them. And if that's going on, something bad's going on. And, and I, I originally developed this for the um, American Meat Institute with my good friend, Janet Riley. And then I got hired by McDonald's to implement this. And at first, it was real interesting watching the animal welfare issue go from this abstract nuisance, give it to PR, give it to the lawyers, make it go away. And I took high level executives out on their first trips to farms and slaughterhouses. This was back over 20 years ago now, it was in 1999. And they saw something bad. It's like a show undercover boss. Oh, we've got things we gotta fix. And we started using the scoring system. It was very, very simple. That plant had to make certain numbers. Like if you couldn't shoot dead 95% of those cattle, one shot off a of captive bolt stunner, you got kicked off the McDonald's food supplier list. And what I've found is that in most cases, rebuilding the whole thing wasn't required. A lot of repairs, a lot of maintenance, also, management caring about doing things right. That's the other big issue. Management's got to do stuff right. And three plants out of 75 plants, plant manager had to be removed. And then things improved. So that's some of the, uh, there's two things I've done, like equipment stuff, and then the um, developing the scoring system. And that scoring system is being used around the world. Very, very simple. You got to figure out what are the important things to measure. It's sort of like traffic rules. The three most important things to measure for traffic would be drunk driving, speeding, and red light stop sign violations, and seat belts and texting. Now, if you just enforce those five things, and we have five things we measure, you'd get 90% of your public safety benefits. See, that's the trick. What's the important thing to measure? So you've written a lot about employment for autistic adults, and the unemployment rate is something that is very high yes. um and i've it per professionally and advocacy wise it's something that i i care a lot about as well what is the best piece of advice if you could give to a young autistic person seeking employment well i would search around for a lot of the back doors also let's start with little kids chores learning how to work early mother got me a job with the seamstress when i was 13 uh, when I was 15 uh, at my school, I was cleaning the horse stalls. Learning, uh, learning work skills before you graduate from high school, I'd recommend. But it's never too late to start. Okay, avoid jobs a lot of multi tent skin, like a takeout window at McDonald's. I want to avoid that. Um, the other thing is the person with autism needs clear guidance on what to do. Uh, any task that involves a sequence, let me make a pilot's checklist where I write down steps. And then I can do the steps. And I had a chance to visit a spirit attack. That's a company outside of Chicago. They test mm -hmm. websites and fancy headphones and things like that. And they've got some big, huge, major clients. And they find a mistake on a website, like a transposed telephone number that was costing the company a ton of business. That's a service that a company uh, really, you know, couldn't figure out why the web page uh, uh, Phone calls went down after the web page got updated. Someone transposed the phone number, and the autistic person found it. That and I think uh, really important. And like Blue Star Recycling is in your home state, Colorado, I think, right? Yeah. And that's again something where they found a, a need for something, and you know that autistic individuals happen to be better at a certain kind of work. That's but right. do you see a problem with? you know, individuals thinking because they have autism that they need to go to these employers like Blue Star or Aspartec, or that if they're good at something, then they're going to excel at it. Uh, and well, those companies I've been are great. I've, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. I still have the problem. I think you have it too, of 
can't time the conversation right. I still can't do that. I've been out Silicon Valley. I've been in the I, I'm, I'm told I hang up the phone awkwardly, you yeah. know, and that'll just never change. Yeah. I've just accepted that one. So <laughs> but, anyway. Uh, no, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, you were talking, I think, were you saying O'Connor? Oh, yeah, Silicon Valley, big tech companies. Yep. Um, I've been out there. You've got people on the spectrum all over those places. And I was really pleased that Elon Musk came out on Saturday Night Live saying he was on the spectrum. Um, so you've got, I've worked on with a lot of engineering companies and with equipment suppliers. I've worked with people that design and build equipment in the meat industry, in the food industry. And when I was out in construction, I spent 25 years in construction, out on jobs. And I'm going to estimate that 20% of the, some of these really high-end skilled trades people with autistic or dyslexic or ADHD. And, and they were saved by the single welding class. And they own big metal fabrication companies. I know one that has, uh, that's very autistic, has got his own private plane. I can't go into any detail. It's, it's they're still living. And I've been on that plane. And I'm uh, just as autistic as he's going to be. In fact, we had a half an hour long discussion on what labels he would have had you know, and he's somebody that's my age, maybe a little bit older. I'm, um, oh, he would have been autistic, opposition defiant, uh, the dyslexic, ADHD, you name it, he would have been it. Now he's flying around the private jet and has a gigantic factory. Well, well, the nice thing about being autistic, especially when you don't like to do lots of different things and you're the boss is you can hire, a, if the more successful you get, you can hire other people. Well, that's what, know. that's, and where there's been really success in high end jobs, is, is they have their own businesses. I mean, I'm an example where I mean, I am a professor at Colorado State, I'm half time at Colorado State, but I'm someone that has my own, uh, my own business. I like working for lots of different places. You know, that's something I like. And, and these people that I work with, a lot of them have had their own businesses, a metal fabrication shop, maybe a big one, maybe a small one. What do you want to be the most known for? What do you think you would be the most known for? You've accomplished so much in your life. Well, one of my big things I'm working on right now is what I call the different kinds of minds. And I've discussed that in my book, uh, The Autistic Brain. This came out in 2013. The visual thinkers like me, the mathematical, visual, spatial, and the word thinkers. And I, one of my mistake I made in some of my early writings is I thought everybody on the spectrum is a visual thinker. That's not true. Okay, can I stop you for one second? Yes. Uh, this is actually a question that I was going to ask you okay. about, um, and, and I'll and I'll pause it. We may, but actually, I was told to to. I'm like, well, are you sure that she said she made a mistake and that she said this? I'm like, well, I think I remember reading it like three or four years ago, but we actually toned the language down. So it's actually one of the very specific questions we have for you. Uh, so I actually recently discovered that I have something that's con called aphantasia. Uh, oh, I'm the, yeah. So, so that is me. So when I was first told that I had autism and I'm suggested to read your, your book, I was not convinced I had autism, right? Because I am the complete opposite of thinking in pictures. The, um, I'm a visual thinker. Yeah. And when I was working on the autistic brain back in 2013, I was on a computer at three o'clock in the morning and put the slate. And I found this paper uh, about object visualizers. There's a difference in object visualizer and a visual spatial, which is a more mathematical one. I kind of was already figuring that out uh, because originally I, thought I called them visual and verbal. But there's actually three kinds. There's the object visualizer that thinks in pictures like me. The HBO movie showed it very, very well. Then there's the more pattern mathematical thinker. That's going to be a programmers. And then you've got a word thinker, and if they're on the spectrum, they tend to love, love facts and uh, things like history and uh, sports statistics, things of this sort. And there's science now that backs that up, and there's a whole lot of science. And then so a lot of people are kind of mixtures. But I then went back to every project where I spent a considerable amount of time on the job site, big food factors. And it was interesting how the work was divided up. The more mathematical engineers did the boilers and refrigeration, the roof trusses, snow load, water and power. And the visual thinkers like me designed what I call the clever engineering department. Super clever, mechanically clever machines, like packaging equipment. Um, then I was talking to somebody in the candy back then, about an old guy who invented the machine that makes candy canes. That being an example of a clever engineering department. And this is where there were a lot of people that I know I've worked with that I know would be autistic. Uh, yeah, and I made a mistake back in, when I did that book that 
the thinking that everybody on spectrum is a visual thinker uh, now know that that's wrong. There's some of them are visual thinkers like me. I updated, I put some updates into thinking and pictures, but the original version, you know, in 1995, I uh, would not have would not have had that. I'm now familiar with Anne Fantasia. Oftentimes good at mathematics, but no visual thinking. Yep. Um, and I've run into a few people that have Anne Fantasia. I didn't know the name of it until relatively recently. That, I just uh, figured it out this year that the name of it, I saw somebody describe like a picture. It was actually of a horse and an example. I'm like, there's a name for this. But what I find most amazing is you admitted you were wrong. Yeah, right? I, I, I was wrong. But, and but, I... And, I, and it's admitted in here. <laughs> no, and, and, and that's, um, and I I think there's another ver version of that book that says thinking across the spectrum. Which well, yeah, the, that's the paperback. Um, yes. Uh, the first version uh, was very literary. And then I, um, thinking across the spectrum and I, I've changed it over the paperback. It's the same book. I, but you see, when I did the autistic brain, see, I found these scientific articles. I was so happy when I found them that showed that there was a difference between a visual thinker that thinks in photorealistic pictures like me and the more mathematical, visual, spatial thinker. And there's a whole lot more research. I'm working on it. We're working on another book right now on just the science on this. And I'm worried that our school system is screening out us visual thinkers because I absolutely can't do elsewhere. I managed to get out of it. Uh, because in 67, when I went to college, it wasn't the required class. Thank goodness. But we need our visual thinkers and we need our mathematical thinkers. And so you need all the different kinds of minds and they can work together. And when I look at the, uh, how we work to, okay, you build a big complicated factory. Right now we have to import equipment that I would call clever engineering department for either a pork or a chicken processing plant from Europe because we're not making it anymore because they took shop out of the schools. So you're not, getting the tiny shops forming that turned into these businesses. I've been in this industry now 50 years. Nobody knows how to weld anymore. You, you know, I was wondering, you, you just got me thinking because my, my youngest is so good at math. math. He's six and he's honestly really, really good. And so he really has a special interest and, you know, a set of skill. And I was wondering if you would recommend that an autistic person follows what they like and get a job in a special interest. Can you see any downside to Yes, and that? the thing is, I want to make a distinction here between an ability and a special interest. Okay, when I'm talking about the object visualizer or you're talking about infantasia or someone's talking about mathematics, that's the ability or the, you know, the, where the special interest might be cars or horses. I that's like to say how thing. somebody thinks versus what they like to do. That's right. They're two different things. Now, when I was in third grade, I just wanted to draw the same horse head over and over again. My mother said, well, let's draw the whole horse. Take that interest and broaden. Okay, we can um, you put math into how fast a horse can gallop. You know, put math in that. Or, or how long it's going to take cars to get to different places. You can do physics on engines. You know, take that, that interest and broaden it. Well, one big problem I'm seeing in the school system now is you get a little kid who might be in the second grade, and he's forced to do baby math over and over again. Then you wonder why he turned into behavior problems when he should have been moved ahead in there. And there's all kinds of great free stuff online. Uh, Khan Academy, uh, code.org for programming, Wolfram Mathematica, that's a really fun website. Stuff is free. And, and the thing that blows my mind in chemistry now is I look at my sciences and my natures and I'm seeing chemistry molecules that are inside the body or there might be material science that look like cathedral windows. Beautiful symmetrical patterns. Some of these math kids need to be exposed to that. Go online to Google Images and type in protein symmetry. Protein symmetry. You'll be amazed at what you see. The pattern thinkers have just got up. Doing it now. Protein symmetry on Google Images. You're going to find really, really beautiful stuff. It is really beautiful. I have no idea of what it is, but it is. Well, beautiful. you'll see designs that are beautiful symmetrical designs. And I. Uh, you know, I go through sciences and natures and then in chemistry, I don't understand a lot of the math, but look at these gorgeous patterns. Well, they, there are certain kids that you show, or grown-ups that you show them that stuff, they're going to eat that right up, but they have to be exposed. Individuals have to get exposed to stuff, get interested. I got into the cattle industry because I got exposed to it as a teenager. Yeah. You're not you exposed, think? you can't get interested in something. 
So do you think that we're sheltering young adults or even adults too much? I think a lot um, of kids, are, I can't believe the kids are not learning things like shopping. I was shopping and handling money when I was seven and eight years old. And I, in, in, in the early fifties, when I was a child, 50 cents would buy like what $5 would buy today. And with my 50 cents, I could get five Superman comics or 10 candy bars. But if I wanted that 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. I was learning that at a very young age. And I'm now realizing just how important that is. And going in stores and buying things. I'm seeing kids that are good students in school and are teenagers and they've never gone shopping by themselves. That's we're ridiculous. Just, yeah. We're just talking about this with Andrew and how we need to talk more about the importance of teaching young kids on the spectrum or not, but we're talking about kids on the spectrum to uh, use money and, you know, all of, everything around money. And I think we, you just touched on that. I take my, uh, my son because he loves money. It's, it's a skill, the numbers, but it's also a special interest. It's both. So I take him to the dollar store and uh, he, he knows the, the, the value of money, what he needs you know, to right. save. And That's because the right. dollar store has, you know, objects that are more than $1. And then he's like, exactly. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. My sister and I, when we were in elementary school, we'd save for an entire month so we could blow our allowance at the county fair. Oh. And mother never, you know, when we want to play those silly games at the county fair, uh, we had to save up for it. And I'm realizing now what an important skill that taught me because it made money real. Yeah. That's yeah. important. Uh, you're totally right. And I think that goes with uh, neurotypical too, but I feel like in school we don't, learn about like for instance taxes and like life skills you know things that are so important that it's like geometry and things like that and i mean it's cool but in real life that doesn't help us much well and you've got kids growing up today have never used a tool they're totally removed from the world of the practical they have no idea how stuff gets here okay a factory another company makes something how does it get here it comes over in a container ship i just knew she didn't know what a container ship was until i showed it to her on her phone yeah, yeah, I'm with you here. We need to. Do you think that's all young individuals, or and especially those on the autism spectrum, because they're taken out of other classes, or it's deemed not as important, or is it the same? Is it just? I think, an it, issue? I think it hurts the autistic kids more than it hurts the normal, so-called normal kids. But I'm seeing, uh, well, the other thing I'm seeing is writing skills are just horrible. I got graduate students right now where I've had to correct the grammar on the journal articles like they're in middle school and then I find out that nobody ever marked up their work nobody uh, just how do you write a business letter down yeah. I when I sent in my my portfolio I had a nice business letter on it see that that's just basic important stuff yeah and my writing skills in ninth grade when I got thrown out of ninth grade were better than a lot of grad students today just straight clear writing and I have to go through the work and mark it all up the other thing I make them do is read their paper out loud like they're giving a speech and then you can really see the mistakes and that's hard to do for a lot of people so it's good to practice but yeah. it, so and these are these are smart students and then i asked well did you ever write a book report when you were in school find out that they hadn't did a teacher ever mark your papers up and make you correct them no they hadn't okay. yeah i, I want to come back to you admitting that you were wrong in your book uh thinking in pictures i think it's so amazing to be able to do that especially right now, you know, with social media and a lot of people are very stubborn, stubborn and it's hard for people to admit that they're wrong, especially wrong. in the autism wrong. community. And, and all I, what I try to tell people is like, okay, I say something, it's the best knowledge I have. And if I find out tomorrow it's wrong, I'll change it. And I was wrong to say that everybody on the autism spectrum thought in pictures, so it's simply not true. And I know that now, but I didn't know that when I wrote the book. So, and I've also noticed that certain, you know, as we've learned a lot about autism, even certain organizations have said things that they've retracted and they've admitted were wrong, but they're still, it's almost like even in the political environment, just in general, that we're penalized more for changing our mind than holding the same opinion for 40 to 50 years. And, and I think it should be the opposite, right? You know, well, you don't learn want to be changing your opinion just sort of like wind changing. C correct but I an mean, there's actual basic, there's basic things that i've been doing all my life you know you know you know you gotta try to do constructive things in life and and people ask me what what turns me on now it turns me on when i'm when i'm an individual with autism or autistic individual writes to me 
that my book helped them out or a parent writes to me that I, another kid has a job and bought a house because of my book. That, um, that makes me uh, really happy. I'm happy when things I engineer work. Uh, that, that keeps me going. And that's a basic drive I've had for my whole life. And, but just changing, you know, there's a lot of other things. So let's say, let's say somebody thinks, well, it's okay to rob a bank one day and the next day it's not okay to rob a bank. Well, I'm not going to make, uh, it's never, it's always bad to rob a bank, period. I mean, some opinions though, sometimes you gain knowledge and insight into something just like you did by looking at scientific evidence and it made you change your mind and in that case it's totally acceptable but also very brave to to admit it and i think that a lot of people even if they know that they were wrong and they have to prove they were wrong they're still not gonna admit it so i just wanted to you know really up, applaud you on that because it's it's impressive well it was just wrong i didn't know any better and and then i uh I started, you know, after I got criticized about it, I started um, talking to more people about how they think, and then I started getting the pattern idea when I read Clara Claiborne Park's book, Exiting Nirvana, about Jesse Parks. And then I got thinking about the pattern thinking. At this point, I had not read any of the scientific papers at that point. Speaking of being wrong, Andrew and I and his wife actually have been talking about whether vegetable or fruit or not, and we don't agree. Are vegetable fruit? Can vegetable be fruit? Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> it's nice to find the words. It's sort of like, I don't even want to fight over that. No, let's get one where, <laughs> where people, where it's more obvious. I don't think broccoli and oranges are, I don't think uh, broccoli is ever going to be a fruit. But let's take a tomato. Is that a fruit or a vegetable? It's a fruit. That's not quite so clear, so clear cut. How do you tomato decide? The bro- fruits tend to be sweeter one thing and the carrots can be sweet and then i go is it really um worth um <coughs> arguing over that well if you're trying to settle a debate between my wife and i tonight then in my mind if you're saying i'm correct then yes it is otherwise no it's probably not <laughs> so a little bit of sarcasm sorry uh <laughs> but no, to your point it's not really worth arguing no, that's not worth arguing. With. <laughs> I think the other thing is, I've spent a lot of my life where I would design something, draw a drawing, and then I'd, then I'd watch it get built. And that's, you know, in construction, it's all about designing a project, getting it built, and making the thing work. It's about real tangible results. And there's an awful lot of stuff happening now with a lot of broad, big concepts. And this is where the verbal thinker, I think, is more different from the way I think than even the mathematician, because the mathematicians and I, we like to plan our projects and not have big mistakes. The verbal thinker, you get big generalized theories, okay, diversity or inclusiveness. Well, how do we actually implement this out in the real world? You see, I didn't try to do everything with animals. I've worked on fixing slaughterhouses. That's something that's targeted. It's something pretty specific. It's not a vague abstraction. But a lot of the education right now is too much in the verbal world, very, very abstract. That's what the big education conference, you know, talking about culturally relevant classes and things like that, but they didn't give any examples. <laughs> Even examples as simple as the music of the culture or the art of the culture. It was all very vague and abstract. Okay, we're going to, to wrap this up with our quick fire question. So what it is, is that I ask you some uh, some question and you, you give me the first answer that comes to your mind. Sounds good? Well, I may not give you the first answer that comes to my mind. But... <laughs> first <laughs> picture? You can't make an answer quickly. One of the things is, is I'm kind of a slow processor. All right, ask me a question. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? The one piece of advice I got from, and I now see Norb, the superintendent of the Swift plant in Arizona. He was one of my early mentors. He said, you always have to persevere. And even when there's hardship, you always have to have persevere. I never forgot that. What do you like to do to relax? Well, I like, you know, I like movies. Like, I remember going to Avatar. I thought that was a fantastic movie. That's something I like to do. Um, also, well, some of the funnest stuff I ever did is we'd sit around the job trailer and discuss how to build stuff. 
<laughs> that stuff I that I find really interesting. What's your favorite movie? Is it Avatar? Avatar is definitely one of my favorite movies. Do you watch TV shows? No, not that much. I, I'm, you know, during all this COVID stuff, I was working on my, my new book on visual thinking. I'm, I've been doing a lot of writing and I've been doing a lot of Zoom calls and there's been some advantages. I've been able to, you know, reach different audiences like you that I had not talked to before. A lot of people in foreign countries, that's been really good. But I'm also hungry to get in the office. Yesterday, they took the masks off at CSU, went into the office, sat down with Monica. She's the nice lady that schedules the classes. And we sat down, we went over my class schedule. Then I talked with the other advisors there. It was so nice to just go back in the office and have some normal collaboration. Well, I had a good time yesterday doing that. Do you enjoy being uh, around people? Yes, I do. And, I, and, and the thing that everybody's missing is that collaboration you do in the office. Now, I think some jobs you could do truly remotely forever, like if your job is airline reservations. But let's say you have any kind of a job like teaching or research or developing um, uh, marketing or anything like that, you need to be talking to other people and there's an informal collaboration that just doesn't happen on Zoom. And that's what I've talked to a lot of people about this. So what I think is gonna happen, uh, there'll be, um, we're getting kind of a hybrid format get them in there two or three days a week. And then there's some stuff that can truly be done remote. Uh, but there's other things where you really need the collaboration. Because I find you go into the office and I talk to another professor and we get a research idea. And that would not have happened being at home. And then you've got jobs that have to be done in person. Now yep. I'm trying to put everything online which I like personally, because I have a really hard time meeting people in person. So that was like a upside of the pandemic for me was. Uh, well, that's what I've heard from a number of people on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, the thing that helped me in the pandemic, I had to get up every morning, showered and dressed for work by seven every morning. That helped a lot. <laughs> uh, I, so I, I will say that I, I'm the same in that way. That's the first thing I have to do every morning. I am lucky that my job was considered essential during the pandemic. So I drove to work. It was just me and a phone. I sent everyone else home, but I was able to get up and shower and go somewhere and get started. And um, I think my wife would have murdered me otherwise um, for driving her crazy. But in all seriousness, being able to, uh, to keep that was important. Well, so. and, and I did have some stuff, you know, livestock is considered essential. So I did have one project for the shop they worked on and uh, when I designed a lamb handling unit uh, during uh, during COVID, uh, my students' projects got messed up. I was still meeting with them every week outside the gazebo. We were being really careful. Is there any anything you want to tell our listener anywhere they can find you online? I prefer the phone. And <laughs> nice. back when I was selling jobs, I got very good on the phone. I'd cold call up, I'd call up meat packing plants. I'd find out that they were building a new plant as I was getting all the trade magazines and I'd say, engineering office, please. <laughs> then I'd get a hold of them and I'd get, oh, can I have Mr. Smith's direct line extension? <laughs> I got really good on the phone. That's like Andrew. Andrew loves calling customer service people. To like lower the Comcast bill. Yeah, oh yeah, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> so like the cable bill. But then also we've got to we got to start looking for a lot more things that are just in the neighborhood. You know, they've taken up the hands-on classes out of the schools. Well, let's look at things we can do in the neighborhood. Maybe there'd be a retired car mechanic and start a car shop. But my assistant Cheryl, she does beautiful crafts. She, she's probably willing to teach a class to you know some kids. Um, there's a lot more there in the neighborhood. A little shop that would be willing to hire somebody. I always ask parents, and they've got teenagers and they haven't worked and they haven't learned any skills. Who do you know that owns a shop? And I'll say, well, we don't know anybody. I go, wait a minute. Who do you know? Maybe he's a manager of something at the supermarket or whatever. And then I push and they go, oh, there's a little mechanic down the street. And he, my kid's 18, so he worked for that mechanic. Or there's a little florist shop or some other thing. And just make it work in the neighborhood. That's a good, good advice. Half of all good jobs are backdoor. So just, I just, let me tell you about one adult. Just then I'll tell you about mine back door. Yeah, so. recent uh, job, um, really good job at a big food safety lab. 
and they receive the samples, you know, powdered milk, meat, all kinds of stuff. And then it has to be tested for, you know, salmonella and E. coli and all those things. This person doing a beautiful job, absolutely follows procedures. You know how they got the job? Somebody's housekeeper knew somebody. This is true. This is right now. This happened in the last six months. This is right now. But that's just an example of a backdoor way into a job. So uh, the person, so almost everyone at my company I've hired through that way. It's my preferred method of hiring. And actually, so one of the individuals you, you spoke with who works with me, I hired him because he was always sharing events all over Facebook. And I noticed that there was a, and I also saw parents and individuals were always looking for support groups or things to do all around the country. And I said, you know, I had to mention it three times. He, he got it, but it was, how would you like to get paid to put together a calendar of events? Nobody else can find these. He was always finding them and sharing them. And then he was talking about autism and driving. And, you know, it's, it's not always just, uh, I like what you're saying about the back door. And the last thing I want to say before, thank you. is I, want, I, want, I, want, I got to say something about driving. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> is um, the name of my company is Planning Across the Spectrum and the company was inspired from your book, Thinking Across the Spectrum. And I currently four plus autistic adults work for me. I pay them all well on purpose. Um, and what does your and, company do exactly? Oh, I'm not sure. No, uh, financial planning. So planning for the future, if I were to say it simply, but there's a few other parts to what we do. Um, but to say in one sentence. Life insurance. <laughs> well, that's the boring part. My favorite part is helping companies like the Aspertech or the Blue Star, for example, um, hire workers and pay them in a way that is inclusive and reflective of, you know, again, neurodiverse workforce and or just um, and investments, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, we're very honored to to have had that conversation with you. And, well, thank uh, you. Keep in touch. Really good you. to be here, and um, hope I helped some people out. Always. You did. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm going to leave thank the you so much. Thank you for having me.